All right, it's time for the annual cocktail party. Georgia and Florida kick things off this Saturday at 3.30 over on uh, ABC. This game's played every single year. Rivalry game between Georgia and Florida always played around the same time of the year. Normally the last Saturday of October, sometimes it ends up rolling over and being the first Saturday of November. It just depends how the calendar falls. But a uh, familiar spot on the schedule for both teams here. Both teams coming off of a bye week. I- I'm not going to make you make you wait to the end of the video here to sort of tell you this, but Georgia's winning this game. Uh, Georgia's dominated this series lately and really uh, since Kirby Smart was hired back in 2016, Florida's only got two wins. Florida beat Kirby in Kirby's first year back in 2016 and then beat him in the COVID year when no one was watching. Uh, so whatever is that, six and two <clears throat> or whatever it is for uh, Kirby against the Gators. And like a lot of times in years past with this matchup here over the last decade or so, Georgia is just a much better team right now than Florida is. Florida is most likely about to begin their fourth coaching search since Kirby was hired at Georgia, right? Billy Napier most likely on the way out. There is some chatter about what he could do here over the last month of the season to potentially save his job. And honestly, that that's kind of what I want to talk about here in this in this uh, uh, video for a little bit. This idea that seems to be floating around uh, from a lot of Florida fans that, well, Florida's four and three, and they just beat Kentucky. And to listen to Florida fans talk, they're on top of the world. And I, I just have to ask the question, like, what, what has happened to sort of the mentality of Florida fans where you can find yourself at this point in the season four and three and coming off a win against Kentucky and somehow think, things are good or fine or headed in the right direction. You know, maybe if this was Napier's first year and you're sitting here at four and three, would have went over Kentucky, two wins in a row, I guess, because you beat Mississippi State before that. I mean, you're talking about two of the worst teams in the SEC. And they're acting like they have some sort of rejuvenated life or something, or like, you know, they're about to go on some type of a run or something. And they, you know, they're high on DJ Lagway. Uh, But but by high on him, I mean they have, you know, they think he's good and they have become chemically imbalanced, like almost literally a a physical high from watching DJ Lagway do what exactly? Uh, 54 of 86 for 1,000 yards, five touchdowns and five interceptions. I know he can run around some too. I'm talking about his passing numbers here now. Carson Beck's caught all kinds of crap this season for his interceptions. He's got two to one touchdown to interception ratio, which is not great. It should be a lot better than that. I I admit Carson Beck is not nearly enough touch. The, the touchdown to interception ratio is way off here at fifteen to eight. But at, for DJ Lagway, it's one to one. I mean, I know he's a true freshman, but you know th- that's mostly the point. DJ Lagway is about to see something he's never seen in his entire life. He's about to go up against the 11 most talented human beings he's ever gone up against in his life at the same time, period. I'm not knocking Lagway. I'm not knocking any of the teams that he's played against. But unless you've been in a hole for the last decade or so, then you already know that this defense that George is going to put on the field Saturday against Florida is going to be the best defense DJ Lagway has ever seen, period. And he's a true freshman. And if you look at sort of what this defense did against Quinn Ewers a couple of weeks ago, the Texas quarterback, a guy that's, you know, was a Heisman hopeful entering the season, is a veteran QB, multiple years as a starter, projected first-round NFL draft pick. And Georgia's defense had him seeing ghosts for the entirety of the game. He was confused. Georgia was mixing up their coverages, mixing up their fronts. They were, uh, they were, uh, uh, you know, shifting and 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 all kinds of things. I mean, yours was just a complete mess. The idea that DJ Lagway somehow in this game is going to be. I had a Florida fan tell me yesterday that uh, that that Georgia hasn't seen anything like DJ Lagway. Uh, what? Uh, come on, come on. Man. We need to calm down. Look. Billy Napier's not a good coach. He, he he doesn't really know what he's doing. I mean, I understand you beat Kentucky and Mississippi State and you think you're on top of the world, but do you remember way back three weeks ago when you lost to Tennessee? Do you remember why you lost to Tennessee? 
It's because Billy Napier. That's why. Billy Napier is why you lost the Tennessee game. Poor coaching. This guy's been there three years. He's never had a winning record. He refuses to hire an offensive coordinator. You know the old joke about it, uh, a, 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 def, uh, a de, uh, what is it, the, a defendant who, uh, what's the joke if you if you hire yourself as your attorney, you have, you have an idiot for a lawyer or whatever the joke is. If you're a head coach and you're calling your own plays, you got an idiot for an offensive coordinator. I, I, the guy is not going to be coaching at Florida for long. I think he should have already been fired at some point this season. We'll see. Uh, I did hear something earlier today and uh, off the record anonymous Florida booster. So take this for what it's worth uh, that Florida would have to win seven games in order for Billy Napier to keep his job. They're at four right now. So he'd have to win three more. They have the Florida state game at the end of the year. I assume that's a win because Florida state circling the drain. Uh, but the other games remaining on the schedule for Florida or Georgia, Texas, LSU, and Ole Miss. I mean, they're not likely to win any of those. Um, you know, but back to this game, though, uh, Florida's without a couple of players, Eugene Wilson and, and, a, and a defensive back. And again, you know, Florida fans, oh, great. You know, here we go again. I, I don't, <laughs> it's week 10 of the college football season. We play around this same time every year. Players get hurt. Players get injured. I, I mean, I, I'm not happy that you have a couple of guys that are out, but you go back and look. You, people are out in this game every year. Like it's week 10. People are injured on both sides. Georgia's got players that aren't playing. This is Billy Napier's third year. Listening, listening to Florida fans talk, it, it's almost as if it's a first-year coach. Oh, yeah, started off bad, you know, but he got a win over Kentucky, and he's four and three. This is year three. This is year three. Look at Mike Elko at Texas A&M. That's what happens when you go out and hire the right coach, a good coach. He can come in and completely turn things around right away. Now, are, are they winning the SEC or a national title? Probably not. But they beat the hell out of you earlier this year, and they're currently in first place in the SEC. Um, Florida has ran the ball well this year. In fact, they ran the ball better than Georgia, if you just look from a numbers perspective. Their defense has let them down on multiple occasions. Florida has, particularly their run defense. And there's been a lot made about Georgia and Georgia's run offense up to this point in the season. It's not what we're used to seeing Georgia be in terms of a running offense. I don't know how much of that is maybe by design. You know, you look at Georgia coming into the season, it was kind of a list of no-name wide receivers. I mean, Georgia fans knew who they, who they were, but it was no obvious superstars with Brock, with Brock Bowers and Lab McConkey gone. There's no obvious superstars at a wide receiver position, right? Even the running back. You bring in ETN out of Florida, uh, and you hope he can do good, but you've never seen him do anything in a Georgia helmet before. So there's some question there, right? And then behind him, you've got the Robinson guy who was coming back from injury, who has since been re-injured. The other Robinson guy has had foot surgery and is out indefinitely. So your backup running back is a freshman in Nate Frazier, right? So you look around the offense and you go, what's the focal point of this team? Well, it's Carson Beck. He was one of the best quarterbacks in the country last year. When you go by stats and numbers, he was top five in almost every single category. Uh, heading into this season, he was on everybody's list of top returning college quarterbacks. He was projected as a first-round draft pick, all of those things. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised that Georgia has come out and made a concerted effort to throw the ball this year. They're actually throwing the ball more percentage-wise, than maybe any team in Georgia history. But it's over 60% of the time now Georgia's throwing the ball. So when you look at just their rushing numbers and, like, where they rank in terms of total yards, uh, yards per game, that kind of thing, both in the SEC and nationally, it's way down from where we're used to seeing a Georgia team. And, and I do wish Georgia was running the ball a little bit better. There's been a couple of games in particular where they didn't run it very well. But for the most part, when Georgia has needed to run the ball and decided that that's what they want to do, they've gone out there and they've run the ball fairly successfully, especially in the second half of some games. You look at particularly the second half of the Texas game last week, that fourth quarter, ETN was virtually unstoppable. Uh, it looked kind of like what we thought we were going to see ETN look like all year when they brought him in through the transfer portal. So I'm not as down overall on Georgia's ability to run the ball as some other people seem to be while also admitting that the running numbers are nowhere near what we're used to seeing them be. But then you look at the play calling, or more specifically the percentage of running pass, and it kind of starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, on to Carson Beck. I talked about it a minute ago with the interceptions that he's had. 
I think Carson Beck's a really good quarterback. I think he's a potential starter in the NFL down the road. It's also true that the interception thing has been unexplainable this year. I, 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 I don't know what's going on. I can't figure it out. I don't know what's going on. Uh, he's got more interceptions already this season than he had all of last season. And, and the eight interceptions doesn't even really tell the whole story. He's had a couple of fumbles, most notably in the Alabama game. Uh, of course, he had four turnovers in the Alabama game, three interceptions and a fumble. And a fifth turnover, really, if you count the, the boneheaded safety he took in the end zone. I mean, I, safety's not really counted as a turnover, but that that's basically what it is, right? You have the ball on this play, and then because of something you do, you don't have it on the next play. I mean, it's kind of a turnover. You have to kick the ball back to the other team, and you, you give them two points. And then the Texas game, uh, three turnovers. So, I mean, you look at Georgia's two biggest games of the year, uh, Bama and Texas, the, the Clemson game, was a big game. I think the conference games were bigger than the Clemson game, so I'm singling out the Alabama and the Texas game. Georgia as a team is one and one in those spots, both on the road, uh, lost to Alabama, uh, beat Texas. Uh, But Carson Beck had seven or eight, if you count the safety, turnovers in those two games. That can't continue, um, obviously. Georgia's season will end prematurely at some point if that kind of a trend continues. Uh, Georgia's like a 15 or 16-point favorite against Florida. If you tell me ahead of time right now that Carson Beck's going to have three or four turnovers this Saturday against Florida, my confidence level in Georgia winning the game goes way down. Now, if you'd have told me that heading into Texas, I'd have given Georgia a 0% chance to win. You know, Beck ended up with three uh, interceptions against Texas. If you'd have told me that before the Texas game, I'd have said, well, that's it. Georgia took their second loss. You just can't overcome that. You even go back to the Bama game, <clears throat> which got out of hand quick in the first half because of turnovers from Carson Beck. You know, Georgia mounts that huge comeback in the second half. That's great. Well, you know, you wouldn't have needed that comeback had it not been for the five Carson Beck turnovers. Four, really. I, I count the safety as one, but four, really, turnovers by Carson Beck that puts you in an insurmountable hole. You can't constantly rely on your defense bailing out the turnover from the quarterback or your offense being able to explode in one quarter or one half to make up for a a bad half or a bad quarter where your quarterback turns the ball over that many times, especially when it's unexpected. Carson Beck, unlike DJ Lagway, to Lagway's credit, because I pointed out his touchdown interception ratio being one-to-one, DJ Lagway, five touchdowns, five interceptions. I know he does things on the ground. I'm talking about passing right now. Uh, He's a true freshman making his first ever starts of his career. He didn't even start the season as the starting QB. So he is literally as green as a college quarterback can be, right? Didn't start the season as the starter, played a little bit here and there, intermittently in some games. Mertz goes down, Lagway becomes your starter. Beck doesn't have that cushion to sort of lean on, to sort of not excuse, uh, but to give a reason maybe for the turnovers. Um, Not only is he in his second year as a starter, but he's a fifth-year guy. He came in in 2020. So this is his fifth year in Athens, his second year as a starter. The only possible explanation, and I, to me, this doesn't even absolve Carson from his turnover issues, but the only possible explanation as to why he's committing these turnovers at the rate that he is, that I've heard that even begins to try to make a little bit of sense is, well, he lost his two kind of safety blankets from last year with Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey. They, they were clearly in sync on the same page and had a lot of chemistry between Beck and those two guys. On top of that, they spent the majority of the offseason probably working with Carson Beck and Ra-Ra Thomas and Colby Young, who were supposed to be Georgia's kind of top two outside wide receivers for this year. And as I'm sure you're aware, neither one of those people are currently with the team. One of them was booted before the season ever started. The other one got booted after I believe it was week four. But anyway, so... You know, Carson's out there with kind of a, a, a patchwork unit of wide receivers. You know, some have are, are, are have been around for a while but are having to play bigger roles because those other guys are gone. You know, Dom Lovett, Dylan Bell, um, Arian Smith, who was another guy who's been there five years and up until this year has been extremely disappointing. Uh, is actually Georgia's leading wide receiver this year with just over 400 yards and three touchdowns, uh, Arian Smith. Um, kind of a, a a smaller guy, but a burner, uh, sort of a, a deep route guy. Um, 
So anyway, Georgia's offense has been at times a little frustrating to watch this year because you don't you're seeing something you're not used to seeing. Number one, which is a throw first team, kind of the opposite of what Georgia's been forever. You know, forever Georgia's been like a run, 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 play action pass, throw the ball. You know, now it's more of a pass, 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 run the ball when they're not expecting it type of thing. And I'm not saying one's right or wrong or or, or whatever, but it's just obvious when you watch the game. And you, you, again, you can look at the play calling stats. It's over 60% pass um, uh, to under 40% run. You start to say, oh, okay, well, no, no wonder some of the running numbers are down. I think ETN's look really good when he's gotten chances. Uh, I, I like Frazier, uh, the, the number two. Of course, he's a true freshman, so you got to be careful putting him out there in passing situations and things like that. But these two teams are just – not just now, but for the last seven or eight years, have just been traveling in opposite directions. Um, <clears throat> I've said it in a joking way before, but it, it's it's not really a joke. It may sound like a joke because it comes from me, but Florida is where Tennessee was in 2017, 2018, 2016, that kind of time frame, 2015. They're not a very good team. They may have a year here or there where they look good and get to eight or nine wins. You remember the 2016 year for Tennessee? I believe they won nine games after the bowl game. <clears throat> but they never won the East, never made the SEC title game, anything like that. But they have what you would consider to be a decent year every once in a while. But then every three years, they were firing a coach, starting over. It, it's, it seems like Florida is where Tennessee was during that period of time. And it took Tennessee, you know, an additional four or five years, another coach or two to kind of get out of that funk from the mid 20 teens. So as far as Florida goes and, and, and where they're at in that trajectory, it's obviously going to depend on the hire that they make next. And that's not something I can predict or project. I mean, at any point, if they hire the right coach there, we all know what Florida is capable of doing as a program. They're in one of the most talent rich States in America, Florida, right? They've got recent tradition by recent. I mean, over the last 30 years of being a pretty good program They, you know, everybody knows who Florida is. It's not, you know, it's not Dion going to Colorado where people go, oh, yeah, I forgot Colorado even had a team. I mean, Florida is more in the forefront and more rel relevant than, than that. Uh, they get the right coach in there. You know, they can become a formidable team again, in the not just in the SEC, but nationally. But they're a long way away from that um, right now. As far as Kirby Smart and his success that he's had against Florida, uh, every year during this game it gets brought up. Well, you know, Georgia or uh, Kirby went to Georgia, so he – you know, always circles this game and you hear fans a lot of times. Um, in fact, if you're a Florida fan or you're any fan watching this, you probably heard fans say the same thing, whether it be with position coaches or coordinators or whatever, but in, in Georgia fans do it all the time too. Like Georgia fans be like, yo, we need to hire David Pollock as defensive line coach and champ Bailey as secondary coach and Heinz Ward as wide receiver. Coach. Like they, you know, they just, they go back over like their last 30 years and they want the best player at every position hired as the current position coach, even though, even if that person doesn't have any coaching experience at all, um, there's a lot made of the fact that Kirby played and went to UGA and now he's the coach here. And does that give him any sort of built-in advantages or legs up over maybe other coaches who are coaching in places where they didn't go? And obviously the overwhelming majority of coaches <clears throat> that are coaching today and in any given year didn't play or go to the school that they're coaching for. You don't have to have done that to be successful. I don't think that's the case at all. And I don't think anybody thinks that's the case that you have to have gone to that school or played for that school in order to be successful there. But I do think there are certain situations where if your coach played for your school and went to your school and he happens to be a really good coach, there are certain situations where the fact that he played for you does give you added benefit. And I think one of those areas, at least for Kirby at UGA, is in rivalry games. I think it's hard for a lot of coaches to manage the uh, rivalry game aspect of college football. You know, you hear a lot of coaches with the coach speak, you know, one game at a time. Every game's the same as the last one. You know, we don't put any more effort or focus on one game than the other. We just want to win every game we play. Kind of the boring, just dried up, generic coach answers that you hear about everything. I think when you have a coach that went to your school, I, they understand and I think are able to communicate to the team better what the rivalry means. 
recruiting is national these days, right? Whether you're an elite program at the top of the college football world, like your, your Georgias or your Bamas or your Ohio States or whoever else, or even if you're just kind of a middling thing right now, like Florida, recruiting is nationwide. You're bringing in kids from all over, right? Fans oftentimes have a hard time differentiating the mindset of a fan versus a player, right? As fans, we hate our rivals. I, oh, I hate Florida. I hate Auburn. I hate Georgia Tech. Or, you know, you're a Florida fan. You know, you hate Georgia. You hate Florida State. You hate maybe LSU or Miami or whatever it is. The players don't necessarily grow up hating the same teams that the fans of the team they play for do, right? Georgia goes out and gets Brock Bowers from California, Okay. You think Brock Bowers walked onto the campus in Athens just hating Florida, going to bed every night, just wanting to beat Florida? No, no. Now, did he develop that during his time at Georgia? Yes, and I think Kirby is part of the reason why. I think a coach that played for your school is better equipped to to, to manage the rivalry situation. To I, I think a coach that played there is more equipped to get the team ready to play these rivalry games, and I think that's one of the reasons that you've seen Kirby have such a good record against all three of Georgia's rivals, Florida, Auburn, uh, and Georgia Tech. Florida has only beat Kirby twice, 2016 and 2020. Auburn has only beat Kirby once. That was in the regular season in 2020, and then Kirby then turned around and beat him two weeks later in the SEC title game. And Georgia Tech has only beat him once, uh, also back in his first year in 2016. So Kirby has just sort of dominated that string of rivalries. Now, it's also true that Georgia's, generally speaking, has just been a better team and program during that period of time. But we all know when it comes to rivalry games, right, because we talk about it all the time, the better team doesn't always win. You see weird things happen in rivalry games, Lou. Throw the record out the window, Lou. It's a rivalry game. I agree to that to a certain extent, right? Uh, But Kirby has dominated these rivalry games. So, you know, the aspect of, well, Kirby went to Georgia, how much of a benefit is that? Do you need a coach that went to your school? I don't think you need a coach that went to your school. Obviously, lots of coaches win. Nick Saban didn't go to or play for Bama. Um, You know, you're you're as a Florida fan, if you're watching this, of course, Steve Spurrier did go to Florida and play for Florida. And I think you would agree he's probably the best coach you've ever had. Urban Meyer won a lot there, too. But Spurrier was there for a longer period of time, right? So you probably understand some of what I'm talking about as a Georgia fan as it relates to Kirby Smart. But you don't have to have that. Urban Meyer didn't go to Florida or play for Florida. He still worked out pretty good as a head coach at Florida, right? Uh, And and I can go on and on and on down the list. And Nate Harbaugh did play for Michigan, so that worked out there. Um, You know, but you can go down the list. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But but as far as like a built-in or an inherent advantage, maybe with the rivalry game situation, I could see where that uh, that could potentially be the case. So uh, do I hate Florida? Well, I'm a Georgia fan. I have to. It's state law here. Um, But, you know, realistically looking at this game, there's a reason the spread is what it is. Now, it doesn't mean that Florida can't win the game, but it does mean that it would be a huge shock and surprise if they did. Georgia's favored by over two touchdowns. This is the second most points Georgia has ever been favored by in the history of this series. So, again, two teams that appear to be heading in the wrong or in different directions, one the right direction, one the wrong direction. I think Florida's about to be starting their fourth or fifth coaching search, whatever it is, since Kirby was hired in 2016, and I think Georgia wins the game. As far as the betting angle goes, (laughs) um, I am a Georgia fan, but I am able to separate my heart and my mind uh, when it comes to putting money on these games. And the reality is Georgia's 2-5 and against the spread this year. Georgia covered the spread against Clemson. And they covered the spread against Texas. So Georgia covered their spread in the first game they played, and they covered the spread in the most recent game they played. Every game in between, they failed to cover the spread. They didn't cover against uh, Tennessee Tech. They didn't cover against Kentucky. They didn't cover against Auburn. They didn't cover against Bama. They didn't cover against Mississippi State. So I'm not going to bet Georgia to cover here. I do think Georgia could potentially win this game by three touchdowns, obviously. I think if Carson Beck plays a clean game and ETN can get going on the ground, I can see a scenario where Georgia wins this game somewhere in the neighborhood, you know, 38 to 17, uh, you know, 41 to 17, 41 to 20, 38 to 20, something like that. If Carson Beck has a couple of turnovers or Florida gets a little bit of a juice or life early, then I can definitely see a scenario where Florida can keep this thing close for a while and Florida could cover the spread. Um, you know, maybe something like 31 to 20, um, you know, 30 to 17, something like that. So I'm going to take Georgia to win. 
Uh, I'm not going to bet Georgia and lay the points because they just haven't done a very good job of covering the spread this year. And this is a high spread for a conference rivalry game here with Georgia being favored by over two touchdowns. But I do think uh, I do think Georgia wins. And uh, as far as Florida man goes, good luck on your coaching search. I don't know what else to tell you. Have a good morning.